Well, hi there. This is a raptor. And so is this. And so is this. And so is this. But that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, this bird is more closely related to a chickadee than it is to a hawk or an eagle. And owls, gosh, we don't really know where they go. The reality is that raptor essentially means that it's a bird with a hooked bill that grabs prey with its feet. Because they aren't the only birds that hunt. They aren't the only birds with hooked beaks. And they aren't all that closely related either. Though they are all part of the same clade, the Telluraves, which is probably the most diverse and interesting clade of all birds. You know, except for the clades that include the Telluraves. And though this is the third clade of birds that we've discussed, this is the first clade within the largest clade of birds, the Neoaves. The clade to which 95% of extant birds belong. The Telluraves is by far the largest avian clade that is any good at grabbing things with its feet. Which probably explains why all of the birds with murderous feet are in this clade. Like I just said, we've already covered both of the clades outside of the Neoaves. The Paleognathy and the Galloanserae. You may also be aware that we have covered the turtles and all of the crocodilians. Which means that once we get through all of the Neoaves, which is no small task, we will have covered all of the Archelosauria. You may also be aware of the fact that this year we're going to complete our tour of the other lineage of extant reptiles, the Lepidosauria. In preparation for the release of our feature-length film on all of the Lepidosauria, this November. But what this also means is that once we finish our tour of the Neo Aves, we could not only create a feature on all of the birds, but also the Archosauria, the Archelosauria, and we could create a single epic video that takes us through all of the Reptilia. And if you'd like for us to get there sooner than later, don't hesitate to type show me the birds down in the comments, if you're into that kind of thing. And if there are other groups that you would like to see us dive into first, don't hesitate to let us know about those as well. But today, we're talking about the grabby birds, including the talon tyrants of the hyperad clade Telluraves. Now, admittedly, Telluraves isn't the only clade of grabby birds, but it is the biggest clade of grabby birds by far. In fact, it's the biggest clade of birds by far. 60% of all birds fall into the Passeriformes alone. And given how grabby this clade is, it's very plausible that the most recent common ancestors of all Telluraves were grabby as well. The Telluraves are divided into four main clades, though the exact relationships between those four clades are somewhat debatable. These four clades are the Ecipitromorphi, which includes hawks and eagles, Strigiformes, the owls, Corassi and Morphe, which includes no raptors, but it has kingfishers in it, so you know it's cool. By the way, if you don't like kingfishers, we can't be friends. Or you're a small fish. The latter being the case, I get it. And the Australavies, which includes the falcons. And terror birds, no big deal. Some of the most recent phylogenies refuse to sort out the relationships between these four groups, and they leave it as a big polytomy. An unresolved node that shows that the four are more closely related to one another than they are to any other groups, but that there isn't enough evidence to conclude which of the four are most closely related. And since 2014, nearly every possible configuration has been proposed, except that the Australavies and the Ecyptromorphi are closely related. So the one thing that we know with confidence is that the falcons are not closely related to hawks at all. But I'm going to leave the relationships between these four as a polytomy as well. Sometimes when there is disagreement, I go with the relationships that seem to emerge from analyses most consistently. But again, the only consistent relationship here is that falcons and hawks are as distantly related as possible within the Telluraves. So I think I'll start with one of those two groups and do the other last. And I'll do the other two in the middle. So uh, the question is just, do we want to start with the hawks and eagles or falcons and terror birds? Let's go with the hawks and eagles, as when you think of raptors, it's probably kind of the default group. And it includes secretary birds, and they're stinking rad. Ecipitromorphi, the hawk form birds. 
This clade includes just four families, but four amazing families. Most distantly related to the others would be the family Cathartidae, the New World Vultures and Condors. When I took Ornithology, I was taught that Cathartids were more closely related to Storks, which would put them entirely outside of the Telluraves. But essentially everything we have learned in the last 15 or so years supports the hypothesis that they are nested within the Ocipitromorphi. And while they're not the closest relatives of the Old World Vultures, the remaining Ocipitromorphs, including the Old World Vultures, are their closest relatives. Do you understand what I'm saying here? If not, I'll explain it when I get to the Old World Vultures. But before we get there, I want to talk a bit about circling behavior in vultures. Have you ever seen vultures circling in the air? Not a good omen, am I right? It's well known that vultures circle something dead or dying on the ground. But, does that make any sense? I mean, if there is something dead or dying on the ground, where would the vultures be? On the ground? Eating? Not circling above, telling everybody else where a good meal could be found and watching it be eaten from 20,000 feet. So why do they circle? Because it's the cheapest way to get high. And being up high is very beneficial because it allows you to see a lot of ground. If there is something dead or dying anywhere around and you have excellent vision, which vultures do, then the higher you get, the more likely it is that you will spot it. The higher you get, the more ground you can see at a given time. But flying is generally very hard work. Climbing to extreme altitudes requires a lot of energy, maybe more energy than it's worth, if you fly like a normal bird. But vultures, do not fly like normal birds. In fact, you can watch a vulture fly for a long time, gaining altitude all the while, while not flapping a bit, just gliding. Which is strange because the most efficient gliding bird in the world falls four feet a second when it isn't flapping. But vultures can climb without flapping because vultures are lighter than air. No, but because sometimes air is lighter than air. Like when it's warm. That is the reason that hot air balloons work. They can go up if you heat the air, down if you let it cool, but not side to side or back in time. When you heat almost anything, the space between the molecules becomes larger. They expand. And the same is true for air. So when air is heated, the molecules spread out more than when the air is cool, making it less dense. So it floats. It rises in the atmosphere. And in a given landscape, some places heat faster than others. For example, a section of bare, dark ground is going to heat much faster than lighter ground or patches with plants or bodies of water. Meaning that some patches of ground get much warmer than others. And the air above those patches becomes heated as well. And because it is warmer than the air that isn't above that warm spot on the ground, it rises. And what you get are huge columns of rising air called thermals. Now, if you're a bird and you fly through a thermal, what you would discover is that for as long as you're passing through the thermal, you would get a free ride up. Of course, once you get to the other side of the column, well, you'd need to start flapping again or you will eventually return to the earth from whence you came. Unless you never came out. Unless you turned back into the thermal before you exited. And you just kept turning and turning until you were miles high and your ability to survey the ground for dead and dying things was limited only by your visual acuity. And that is what vultures do. And not just vultures, but really this entire group excels at this type of flight. Because dead or dying things aren't the only things worth looking for down below. There are also alive and not dying things that you could make dead with your pointy grabby feet. But to spot things down below that are dead, soon to be dead, or that you could make dead, you need to not only fly high for cheap, but you need to be able to fly very slowly. Ocipitromorphs generally have long, broad wings with fingers. Not real fingers, but the flight feathers at the tips of the wings fan out like fingers. They're called slotted. And each finger acts like a tiny wing. This means that they generate tons of lift, which is the force that counteracts gravity. 
But broad wings also generate a lot of drag, which is the force that counteracts thrust. Short broad wings, like what you find in many galliform birds, are good for generating huge amounts of rapid thrust for burst flying, but they generate too much drag to fly efficiently for very long. Birds like albatrosses have long, thin wings, which generate a lot of lift with little drag. They are incredible for long distance high speed flight, though they can barely get off the ground. But wings like those of vultures and other occipitromorphs are perfect for getting off the ground and then generating tons of lift for low speed soaring and riding the balmy uplifting currents of thermals. The remaining three families of occipitromorphs fall into the clade occipitroformes, which also means hawk form birds. So these are the hawk form hawk form birds. A little reminiscent of last week, if you ask me. But that clade includes the Sagittariidae, the secretary birds that look like hawks on stilts, the Pandionidae, ospreys, and the hawk form, hawk form, hawk form birds of the family Accipitridae, the hawks, eagles, kites, harriers, and old world vultures. And this is why I said that new world vultures are not the closest relatives of old world vultures. The closest relatives of old world vultures are the other occipitrids. In fact, there are no members of the occipitromorphy that are less related to old world vultures than are new world vultures. They have many similarities because they fill a similar ecological niche and they're both occipitromorphs. But their vulture form is due to convergence, not shared ancestry. But that was only half of my earlier statement. When speaking of the New World vultures, I said that the remaining occipitromorphs, including the Old World vultures, are their closest relatives. And that is because the last time that the New World vultures shared common ancestors with anything else alive today, it was here. And they are equally related to everything that came from that ancestor, which would be all of the occipitroformes. Anyway, the Occipitromorphy is obviously a rad group, and I would love to make more videos in the future about them. You know, if you're into that kind of thing. But that is honestly not the group that got me wanting to talk to you about birds of prey. The group that first got me excited about raptors was this group, the Strigiformes. Owl form birds. Owls. Despite the fact that owls, like hawk form birds, are also hook-billed sky predators with grabby death feet, they live in a different world from the hawk form birds, which requires a very different set of tools because they were born in the darkness. Molded by it. Which really throws off basically everything about the hawk form way of life. For one thing, not a lot of strong thermals after the sun has set. And you can't see very far anyway. So flying up to astounding altitudes would be both energetically costly and futile. Instead, they tend to look for prey from a high stationary perch, flying only from perch to perch. Thus, they do not have the long fingered wings of hawk form birds, but shorter fingerless wings, more suited to short flights with easy takeoffs and built for utter silence. We can make a whole video just about that. But silence is very important at night. During the day, it's easy to see very far. But at night, it's difficult to see very far, even if you have eyes like an owl. And so almost everything that is active at night is highly attuned to using sound to find prey and avoid predators. This includes owls and the animals that they eat. So owls need to be silent and they need to have exceptional hearing. And their heads were built for that. And they're super weird. Now birds, like all dinosaurs and all reptiles, assuming that synapsids are not reptiles, lack external ear pinnae, the fleshy dish that funnels sound into the ears of mammals, which has a couple of effects. First, if you don't have those, less sound is collected by the ear itself. And there is no structure of the pinnae that can give information regarding the vertical position of the sound source. Because there are two ears, sounds coming from the left, or the right hit the ears at slightly different times, letting the bird know from which side the sound originates. But what if the sound comes from above or below? Without turning their head sideways or locating the sound visually, there's no way to find its source, unless you're an owl. Not only do they have facial discs that funnel sounds into the ears and can be adjusted to pinpoint specific sounds, like feather face pinny, but their ear canals themselves are asymmetrical. 
one point slightly up and the other slightly down, meaning that they get auditory information about the location of sounds in three dimensions. Handy, because owls live in a dark, three-dimensional world. But owls do not echolocate like many bats. Vision is still very important for navigation and finding prey, and that is evidenced by the size of their eyeballs. They're huge! Too huge to justify muscles large enough to move them. This is actually pretty common for birds. But even more extreme in owls, as their eyes are not only huge, but somewhat tube-shaped. As a result of the fact that they can't move their eyes and their necks are deceptively long, most birds can turn their heads very far to see. But most birds have eyes more on the sides of their heads than do owls. Owl eyes are oriented forward, and on top of that, their facial discs limit their peripheral vision. So to see in all directions, they need to be able to turn their heads very, very far about 270 degrees. And given how short their necks appear to be when they're concealed by feathers, it looks positively Toy Story. But this allows owls to look all around without moving anything but their heads, keeping sound to an absolute minimum. But being unable to move their eyes is only one problem created by their excellent vision. Owls need to be able to see objects that are quite far away in very low light. They excel at this. But all of that specialization comes at the cost of being able to see well up close. They can't focus on objects close to their faces. Say, objects at the distance they would be, say, after being grasped by an owl. Which is why the whisker-like feathers on their faces, called rictal bristles, are so important. Up close, they can feel what they can't see. Owls, they're just amazing. They need their own video. The modern owls fall into two families. The Titanidae the barn owls, and the strigidae, the typical owls. Sometimes you hear them called true owls, but that's as big of a problem as false gharials. Both families are true owls. Heck, the two family names both mean owl in Greek and Latin, respectively. I could geek out about owls for a long time. But I also want to talk about kingfishers and terror birds. But uh, one thing at a time. Corassi and Morphe. This is the only one of the four main Teleraves clades that doesn't contain any raptors. But even though many configurations exist of the four clades, all of them that I have seen have Coraceomorphi nested somewhere in the middle. So it may be the least raptor, but there is no argument for excluding them from the Teleraves. And it does include the king. Not to mention amazing birds like this. And this, and interestingly, Coraceomorphi means raven form. So, so far, our four major clades are the hawk form birds, which contains the hawks, the owl form birds, which are all owls, and the raven form birds, which does not contain the ravens. And the best part is that the ravens are in one of the four clades of the Teleraves, just not this one. So to be clear, hawks are hawk form birds, owls are owl form birds, but ravens are not raven form birds. And if you plan to film yourself furiously protesting future ornithology meetings about it, please tag us in the video. I really don't want to miss that. Fight the good fight! Okay, so we know that ravens are not raven form birds. But what are the raven form birds? Some of the raddest clades of birds that you will ever see in your life, that's what. And the raven form birds least related to all of the other raven form birds are the clade Coleiformes, commonly known as mouse birds. One of the only groups of birds confined exclusively to one continent. Though interestingly, not the only member of the Coraceomorphi in the club. And if you remember, the nearly entirely flightless clade Paleognathy, well, they're found all over the world. Birds tend to get around. Not these, though. They are only in Africa, south of the Sahara Desert. I asked A.I. Clint about the etymology of the word Coleiformes, since I couldn't seem to find it myself. He said that it meant stub or dock tail, since they have short tails. Uh, and, and so I informed him that mouse birds have very long tails. Uh, he then apologized and said that it meant long legs, since they have long legs. Which they don't really seem to have. I closed him and opened a fresh conversation with the guy. He then told me that it means clumsy, because they're clumsy. I told him that they aren't clumsy, and he said that names don't always accurately depict the actual behavior of the group, and he reiterated that it means clumsy. I closed that one and opened a fresh conversation. This one told me that it means short legs, since they have short legs. I'm pretty sure that A.I. Clint is really just a parent at the zoo that knows nothing about animals but feels obligated to answer all of its kids' questions. 
So for all you AI Clint fanboys and girls, he's just not ready for this job. Unless you just want somebody to tell you lies and stumble over terms. But I don't know what Kaleiformes means, so if you do, please share with us. See, AI Clint, it is okay to admit when you don't know something. So I don't know why they are called Kaleiformes, but I do know why they are called mousebirds. For starters, they're small and gray or brown. They dart around with very mouse-like movements. They have long, thin, mouse-like tails, but most importantly, they are soft and fluffy. Their bodies are covered with thin, hair-like feathers that give them a very similar appearance and feel to a mouse. The six species in the single extant lineage, Coleidae, represent the last of a once much larger lineage of mouse birds, what we often call a living fossil. Which isn't to say that they are unchanged from their ancient relatives and ancestors, but that they are all that is left of a once much larger clade. Their closest extant relatives are all of the other members of the Coraceomorphi, the clade Cavitaves, which I think would be the hollow birds, or cavity birds, in reference to the fact that they nest in hollow cavities. And the most distantly related member of this clade is another living fossil, the clade Leptosomiformes today represented by one family, Leptosomidae, which only has one species, the cuckoo roller, which is found only in Madagascar. Lepto is Greek for thin or narrow. Soma is Greek for body. So apparently they have thin bodies, which is fair. They do have rather large heads relative to their bodies. So a case can be made for calling them monster noggins or thin bodies, if you ask me. What you can't make a case for is calling them cuckoo rollers, as they aren't cuckoos or rollers. They aren't even remotely close to being cuckoos. At least rollers are part of this same clade. And while rollers are among the closest relatives of cuckoo rollers, cuckoo rollers are not the closest relatives of rollers. For the same reason that old world vultures are among the closest relatives of new world vultures, but new world vultures are not the closest relatives of old world vultures. And one big difference between cuckoo rollers and true rollers is that true rollers do not show noticeable difference in appearance between males and females. There's no sexual dimorphism. Where male cuckoo rollers look very different from female cuckoo rollers. The closest relatives of the cuckoo rollers are the other members of the cavitaves, the U cavitaves. U being the prefix generally meaning true. So not only is the cuckoo roller not a true cuckoo, nor a true roller, Apparently, it's not a true cavity bird either, though they do nest in tree cavities. So that seems about as ridiculous as not including all of the spiders in the true spiders. It's an outrage! Cuckoo rollers needed a win. Gosh, all their closest relatives are extinct. Couldn't we give them this? Well, among all of the chosen ones of the true cavity birds, the most distantly related members are the Trogoniformes, Trogons and Quetzals. This is a group that I didn't know to exist until I took ornithology, back when New World vultures were still basically storks, and I've never forgotten them. Though if you're Guatemalan, un chapin, not knowing what a quetzal is is as outrageous as a gringo not knowing what a bald eagle is. I mean, not only is the resplendent quetzal the national bird, and not only is it on their currency, quetzal is the name of their currency. Some would argue that it is the most beautiful bird in the world, and certainly more noble than our national symbol. Am I right, Alexander? Sorry, uh, I just threw that in because it might be nice to have Hamilton on my side. But there is probably un chapin out there somewhere that doesn't know what a quetzal is. I mean, I did find a gringo who didn't know what a bald eagle was a few years ago. It was one of the most shocking experiences of my life. Trogon is Greek for nibbling. So these are the nibbling form birds, because they nibble out their own nesting cavities. Today there is only one family of nibble form birds, the Trogonidae, which again includes both the Trogons and the Quetzals, which are all spectacularly beautiful. And they are found in the more tropical areas all around the world, though mostly in the Americas. So finally, a group distributed more like a proper bird clade. And the closest living relatives to the glorious nibble form birds are the rest of the Eucavitaves, the Pico Coraceae, the woodpecker ravens, which includes woodpeckers, but, but not ravens. So for the second time in this clade, we have a reference to corvids. Despite the fact that corvids are not part of this clade. I bet they were once thought to be a part of it. 
Either that or most ornithologists like corvids as much as I do. That is a family that definitely needs its own video eventually. Anyway, the first group to diversify away from the rest of the woodpecker ravens was the clade Buceratiformes, the oxhorn form birds, hornbills, and hoopoos, which are made up of four families. The Buceratidae, hornbills of the zazu form variety, Though many have an extra horny cask above that Zazu did not have. Outside of the Americas, a bird with a bill like that is probably a hornbill. Unless it has giant stilt legs, in which case it is probably a ground hornbill of the family Bucorvidae. Hoopoos, they don't have bills like this. Their bills are similar in length and curvature, but much, much thinner. Perfect for inserting into small holes looking for edible arthropod morsels. Hoopoos can be broken down into two families, distinguished by their love or dislike for 80s punk culture and hairstyles. With the Phoniculidae, the wood hoopoos, being more conservative, and the Upupidae hoopoos being considerably more hardcore. Upupa being Latin for hoopoos, which are found in that part of the world, and probably due to the sound that they make when vocalizing. Phoniculidae from the word phoenix, which might just refer to the purple plumage that some possess. They're far too square to be compared to a phoenix. They're not even a flock of seagulls. The remaining clade in the Coraceomorphi are the Pico Dynastor Nithis, which are, as far as I can tell, the rulers of the woodpeckers. A group which includes the woodpeckers, so it is nice to see that they have some degree of self-determination. Though I don't know why the non-woodpeckers in the woodpecker clade Picaformes, or the members of the clade Coraceiformes, I don't know why they get a say in woodpecker affairs at all. Though it is nice to see the true rollers finally make an appearance. But let's start with the woodpecker form birds, and we'll save the rollers for last. Picaformes is a pretty big clade containing nine families. I might not dig into the etymology of all of them. But these families are the Gabulidae from the Americas, but they look and act a lot like Old World bee eaters. Some look a lot like giant hummingbirds. Not really giant, but they'd be huge for hummingbirds. Buconidae, puffbirds, monklets, nunlets, nunbirds, and other Catholic birds from the warmer parts of the Americas. Megalaemidae, Asian barbets. Libiidae, African barbets. Capitanidae, New World barbets. Semnornithidae, Toucan barbets, and Ramphastidae, actual toucans, which also have big, soft, fruit-eating bills like hornbills, except in the Americas. Indicatoridae, honey guides, known for leading people, but not honey badgers, to beehives. And finally, Picidae, woodpeckers, piculates, rhinecks, and sapsuckers. The eye eyes of, well, most places that aren't Madagascar. But since they don't have the rad incisors and funky fingers of their lemur niche mates, they have to have another solution. Just bashing the heck out of trees with their faces. It's perfection. Well, other than the fact that such pecking would generally break your beak, detach your retinas, and simultaneously scramble and cook your brain. Other than that, it's perfection. But woodpeckers deal with it by having strong, self-sharpening bills, hyoid tongue bones that wrap around the back of the skull to cushion the small, simple brains that they have packaged in tightly fitting, spongy skulls like electronics and styrofoam. Nictitating membranes that hold their eyes in place and protect from debris, and they peck in bursts to allow time to dissipate heat, among other things. We can make a whole video about just that. Those of you that are worried that we're going to run out of ideas for videos, don't. <laughs> Though I do love your suggestions. But that brings us, finally, to my favorite clade within the Coracea morphy, the Coracea formies. Coracea formies, raven form, raven form birds that aren't ravens and aren't very closely related to ravens. But it does include the rollers, finally, and kingfishers. I just, I love kingfishers so much. As well as the aforementioned old world bee eaters, mutt mots, and toadies. But a group I would have called the slammers, not only because corvids aren't part of the group, but because they almost universally incapacitate prey by slamming it on something. The ravenless slammers are comprised of six distinct families. The Meropidae, bee eaters, which really do specialize on eating hymenopteran insects in flight. Coraceidae, true rollers, which also hunt in flight and perform many aerobatic stunts, such as rolls, hence the name. Brachyteraceidae, ground rollers, 
which do form a monophyletic group with the rollers. So there is a clade that includes just the rollers and the ground rollers. But you know what isn't anywhere close to that group? Cuckoo rollers, Tatidae, toadies, which are glorious little birds from the Caribbean. They look like ruby-throated hummingbirds with shorter bills and bigger heads. Glorious. Motmotidae, motmots, which are beautiful birds from the American tropics. Beautiful colors with generally long tails and two really special ornamental tail feathers that look really incredible in flight. I mean, the kind of bird that if you see one while you're out birding, it'll just take your breath away. And last, but certainly not least, Alcidinidae, kingfishers. Including the charismatic, but uncharacteristically drab kookaburra of Australia and New Guinea. These are fun hunters to watch. And probably part of the reason that they have such a special place in my heart is because this entire clade has been made up of really beautiful birds. But most of them live in places that I dream to visit, but where I do not live. But I grew up getting to enjoy kingfishers at the lake by my house. That said, the bulk of their diversity lives in the rad regions of the world where I hope to go one day. And if you want me to take you all with me, please consider supporting us on Patreon. But right now, we have one final clade of Telluraves to explore, and one more group of raptors, which includes several of my absolute favorites. Not to mention giant killer terror birds, and the majority of all extant bird species in the world. And that clade would be the Australaves, which does include ravens, but doesn't include raven in its name because Coracia morphi well, they talk so much about them that it would just feel redundant. Australaves means the birds of the south, for reasons that totally escape me. They're plenty common in the north, too. I mean, most of the Earth's land mass is currently in the northern hemisphere. These birds are all over the north. So it will be interesting as we dig into this group to find which, if any of the groups nested within it, are uniquely found in the south, like penguins. But these southern birds, the the fourth of our four major clades itself includes four major clades. And the clade most distantly related to the other three is the clade Ceriamiformes, which means Ceriamiform. Which makes sense, since the two species of South American Ceriamas of the family Ceriamidae are the only remaining members of this lineage. Living fossils, if you will. Both remaining species are long-legged, reflecting their running lifestyle, though they can fly when necessary, something many of the now extinct members of the clade could not do. Like these, the terror birds. Some of them were three meters tall, 10 feet, an apex predator, and the only known large predator to successfully colonize North America from the South just a few million years ago, the most recent time that the two continents came together. You know, at the same time that the opossums made their way up high-fiving shrews. They were actually running from terror birds. And the terror birds followed close behind. And it is possible, but still unconfirmed, that they made it a lot farther than just to North America. Into Europe and Africa as well. Though its jaws were not super strong, that hooked beak was very sharp. And you don't need much force if your knife is sharp enough. Sounds like something a serial killer would say. And if there's ever been a bird that was well suited to killing people, it was probably this one. Except for the fact that it is not apparent that they were ever at the right place at the right time to eat a human. Though they may have died out just a few thousand years ago. So maybe if we get lucky, we can find enough genetic material to give them another chance. But the big picture here is that all of these families were and are primarily found in this southern hemisphere. Though many of the other ancient lineages were well established in the north. We'll still chuck this one up for the south. The remaining three clades are all part of the clade U. falconomorphi, the true falcon form birds. And guess what? It includes falcons, and ravens, and cockatoos. It's a fun group. And within the true falcon form birds, the group least related to all of the others are the falcons of the clade falconiformes. The falcon form, true falcon form birds. So all of the other true falcon form birds are more closely related to one another than they are to the falcon form birds. But what can you do? We've been waiting a long time to talk about falcons. And that is just because the one thing that we know about falcons is that they aren't very closely related to hawks and eagles or vultures. 
But I think the Hawks and Eagles thing is the most surprising. In fact, Hawks and Eagles used to be part of the Falconiformes, until molecular analysis became a bit more widespread and we found out that despite looking like falcons in ways that are very conspicuous to our biased minds, they aren't very closely related to falcons at all. Today there is only one extant family of Falconiformes, the Falconidae, falcons and caracaras. This includes rad birds like peregrine falcons and possibly my favorite falcon, the American kestrel, which I have seen in person in both North and South America. Falcons are found pretty much all over the world, and that would be true even if I were just talking about peregrine falcons, which have the largest distribution of any bird on Earth, not to mention the highest top speed. These aren't birds built for slow, high altitude surveying. These are fighter jets. In fact, many features of fighter jets are based on attributes of falcons, though one species specializes on hymenopter and insects, and uh, kind of looks like a crow and a chicken had a baby. So caracaras, even more than falcons, look like accipitrids with bald faces. The forest falcons and laughing falcons, which aren't monophyletic with the falcons, look something between a falcon and a hawk. But the falcons, which are the majority of the falconids, are fairly easy to distinguish from a hawk, both if you can see them up close or in flight. Up close, you might notice that their beak has a hook, like all of the other grabby foot murder birds, and also shrikes, among others. But in addition to the hook, the bill often possesses an extra tooth-like projection called a tomial tooth. It's not a tooth. The tooth birds went extinct with their non-avian dinosaur cousins at the end of the Cretaceous. But it acts a bit like a tooth, and it fits into a notch called the mandibular notch on the lower jaw, and together they act like a pair of shears. If you see this, you know that you have a falcon, a shrike, or a kite. Shrikes are little birds related to corvids and the passeriformes that we will discuss soon. They look like sparrows, but spend all day impaling things on thorns and barbed wire fences. You probably won't confuse one with a falcon. But kites are accipitrids. To tell a falcon from a kite, you'll need to see it in flight. Because kites have low-speed fingered wings like a proper accipitrid. But not falcons. Falcons have long, thin, pointed wings built for speed and maneuverability. They're fighter jets, after all. And that brings us to the last two major clades within the Telluraves, the members of the clade Cetaco Passere, the closest relatives of the Falconids, the parrots, and the passerine birds, which is what the word Cetaco Passere means. It is just Cetacoformes, which means parrot form, and Passeriformes, which means sparrow form, jammed together. Kind of like Benifer, Brangelina, Shafani, or Swelsi. These are the Paros. Sitaco Passere. And I'll start with the parrot form birds, because I've gotten a bit of flack for calling budgies, cockatoos, and cockatiels parrots. But they are, so get over it. At least if these are parrots. These are parrots of the family Strigopidae, which means owl-faced. One of four extant parrot families, generally called New Zealand parrots. I saw tons of them when I was in New Zealand. These are kias, kakas, which spell their names like Dave Kaufman, and the famously flightless kakapos. I've never heard anyone ever argue that they aren't parrots. Though I just argued that forest falcons and laughing falcons are not falcons. Though I could just as easily say that they are if you're cool with calling caracaras falcons as well. It's just that caracaras are more closely related to falcons than are the laughing falcons or forest falcons, so they can't all be falcons without the caracaras. What I'm saying is that if you want to kick the New Zealand parrots out of the parrots, then I'll agree with you that these guys are not parrots either. The family cockatooidae. Cockatoos. Otherwise known as mohawk parrots, starting now. Unless New Zealand parrots are not parrots. Then they're just mohawk parrot form birds. But cockatiels would still be cockatoos. Unless you kick out the black cockatoos. And the only parrots left would be the family's Cetacidae, African and New World parrots, like African greys, macaws, conures, and parakeets, and Cetaculidae, Old World parrots, like king parrots, lovebirds, lorikeets, and budgies. Both of these names just mean parrot. But you could kick out the Old World parrots, the cockatoos, and the New Zealand parrots if you really want to get the budgies out of the parrots. But of course, that would be the majority of all parrots. Budgies are far from being the hagfish of parrots. But that brings us to the final clade of the Telluraves. 
A clade that includes ravens, shrikes, chickadees, sparrows, finches, robins, mannequins, lyrebirds, bowerbirds, birds of paradise, jays, magpies, starlings, larks, flycatchers, warblers, waxwings, thrushes, oxpeckers, mockingbirds, wrens, nuthatchers, tanagers, and buntings, just to name a few. The sparrow form birds of the clade Passeriformes, which includes the overwhelming majority of all birds on earth today. Over 140 families. It would be easier for us to cover every bird not in this clade in one video than to cover this single clade in one video. Let alone try to squeeze it into the end of this video. So it's gonna get its own video. Probably multiple videos. So please comment if you would like to see that sooner than later. You know, if you're into that kind of thing. And please tell me, which is your favorite group from the Telluraves? And what would you like for us to cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. And the Upupidae hoopoos. <laughs> and the Upupidae hoopoos. <laughs> oh dear. Is it really you poopidae? <laughs> hoopoos? You poopidae! That's who. Buconidae. Puffbirds, monklets, nunlets, nunbirds, and other Catholic birds from the warmer parts of the Americas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. These are the limitations of hot air balloons. Yeah. We can go up and down, but not side to side or back in time. <laughs> not forward in time. So yes, they can. All the time. All the time. <laughs> Not rapidly, yeah. but kind of at a typical speed. Mm -hmm.